Okay, and our other celebrity, Ms. Goodwin, is going to come up and talk to us about what happened at the ledge. And again, we thank you so much for all your hard work. Appreciate it. Hello, I'm Vicki Goodwin, and I'm running for Texas House District 47. <laughs> so I am a candidate now that session is over. We start that whole game all over again. So, um, but session was fabulous. Um, go ahead on to the next slide. I, I just have to say that I, I think I've discovered how Tiff Street stays in business. <laughs> Because every time someone wanted to thank us, we had another Tiff Streets box in our office, which uh, added a couple of pounds. Susan in my office was very good about not always eating the cookies, so she kept her figure. But uh, We certainly appreciated all the people that came into our office and all the people who came up to the Capitol, because it really did make a difference. Did any of y'all come up to the Capitol during session to testify? So, or, or just to register a vote. Yesterday I was speaking to somebody who said that he sent emails. And I said, emails are great, but what's really impactful is when a bill is in front of a committee. And as a committee member, we're sitting there looking on our computer and we can see how many people have registered for or against that bill. So a lot of times um, the emails will come in 100 at a time and it's hard for members to look through all those emails. And one of the things I'm very gratified about during the session is that I had my staff re reply to every email individually. Um, they pushed back against that a little bit because most offices don't do that. But I said, you know, if somebody's asking me to vote a certain way on a certain bill and I've done that, shouldn't we let them know so that they can appreciate the fact that I voted their way and so that they'll tell their friends. And uh, so I got so many people. Good move, and we plan to do it next time. So, uh, oh, no, I'm still on that one. <laughs> um, so was it what I expected? Pretty much it was what I expected on steroids. The amount of people who come into the office is just incredible. Um, particularly in the beginning, when we're just filing bills, they're coming in to tell us the issues. Um, a lot of individuals, a lot of lobbyists, a lot of school people, because this was the school session. So does anyone know what this session was referred to as repeatedly? The Kumbaya session. Because it was so much friendlier than last session, so much friendlier than a lot of the past sessions. And it was. I mean, we got a lot of good things accomplished. But there were a lot of things that we, we still need to do. So I am so thankful for groups like you uh, working hard even now today as you're sitting here listening to the presentation. Because while nine seats will get us uh, the majority in the House, we need more than that. We need 12. We need as many as we can get. Because I have to say, on certain issues, such as women's health care, we don't get every Democratic vote. So. Just keep that in mind. Work hard. And what, what surprised me the most actually was that some of the votes really seemed like no-brainers. For example, y'all might have read in the paper today about the um, murder, that 43-year-old uh, cold case that was solved using DNA. And so one of the bills that came to us in the Homeland Security Committee that I'm on was about DNA collection. And before the hearing, I had three women come into my office. One of them is Teresa Bastian, which y'all probably know, and two other women who had similar stories to share. They said that their um, family members had, or um, the police were able to find the perpetrators of crimes based on DNA evidence, but not DNA evidence collected in Texas. And so Texas has, has collected it upon conviction, but not upon arrest. And after hearing all of the testimony, it just seemed like a no-brainer that we should collect it. It's like a fingerprint. And a lot of people say, well, what about due process? Again, it's like collecting a fingerprint. It's a swab. And the markers that they keep, there's only 20 markers, and they can't identify the person. They can't identify the gender. They can't identify anything in about the person, but when you match them up to somebody else's DNA, uh, those 20 markers, they can be an exact match and they can help solve a crime. So to me, that was, a, a, um, after hearing the testimony, was something to um, vote for and it did pass, but it was a very close vote. So some things like that were surprises to me. And are you glad session is over? <laughs> yes. 
All right, now next slide. All right, the big thing for the session was school finance reform. And I think that we came up ultimately with a really great school finance bill. Not perfect, we still have some other things to do. Um, going back next session and really, we shouldn't leave school finance to be something we do every two decades. It's something that we need to look at every time. The good thing is we increased the basic allotment from $5,140 to $6,160. That's a huge increase per student payments. And what that does is it really makes a difference in the recapture amount for our Central Texas districts. For Austin, for Eanes, Le uh, Leander, actually, it helps every single district throughout the state. And that's the good thing. Um, it allows for teacher raises. So at one point in time, the Senate was talking about a $5,000 across the board teacher raise. The problem is that we, we should be leaving that in the hands of the local control and let them decide how to give the raises and not just to teachers, but to librarians, to cafeteria workers, to bus drivers, to everybody. And so this way they can do that. And there, also we heard the concern about, well, if you just leave it to the districts, they may not give us the raises. Well, the bill says that 30% of the increase in basic allotment has to go to, to raises, not just for teachers. Um, also, it provides full day pre-K for four-year-olds, and so um, that's wonderful. But we, maybe next session, can also look at adding in three-year-olds. And we might expand who's able to um, have full day pre-K. Um, it also increased the state share from 38% to 45%. We were hoping to get it 50-50, 50% state, 50% local. Uh, we're not quite there, but we made a big jump. And it does also give property tax reform. Uh, you will see a difference in your property taxes. It may not be huge, but that's what so many people called for, and so um, that's part of the bill. Personally, I, I would like to see more money go into the classrooms, and I'd like to just see that <clears throat> property taxes don't escalate as much as they have in the past, and that's where the basic allotment increase will help. Um, but, you know, we had a, a lot of people looking for the property tax reform. The one good thing is they, the leadership was looking to increase sales tax 1%, but the Democrats killed that. <clears throat> And it wasn't just Democrats, actually. A lot of Republicans realized that that's not good for your average household. And so um, the one thing is, I do expect that that will come up again next session. So a lot of these things that we killed this session will come back. So we have to watch out for that. Go ahead to the next slide. Some other things with education, we heard a lot from teachers and parents about the high stakes testing and how we need to cut back on that. So we did have a couple of bills that will um, decrease the number of tests. And the idea that we are sending out to the superintendents is this should not be such a high stakes test. We are not basing uh, pay increases on star test results. And so that's a really great thing because initially that was star test or, t or standardized testing results. But what they ended up with is they said, if your school districts wants to come up with a way to incentivize is paid to do that. And so there is, um, if the school wants to take up some sort of merit pay they're able to, but it absolutely does not have to be tied to the STAR test. Uh, financial literacy was a bill that I introduced. It was to ensure that all of our high school students took at least one semester of personal financial literacy, just so that they would know how to budget when they go off to college, so that they know how, what interest rates are, what loans are, what it means to repay it or not repay it, um, just to give them that basic understanding. Currently, it is an optional course, but when something's optional, you have a lot of people that don't follow through. So um, we had a number of, uh, like I said, a lot of people who were in favor of this. I think it passed almost unanimously out of the House, but then it got to the Senate, and all of a sudden superintendents got concerned about, well, who's gonna teach it? 
how are we going to handle this logistically? How are we going to get all of the students through the class? And so they ended up in the Senate changing the bill back basically to where it was uh, optional again. So during the interim, that's something that we're going to work on. We're going to try to reach out to the superintendents and say, there's free training out there right now. It's online. The, um, the coursework is there as well. So there wasn't any cost to the schools. And in fact, there are some of the courses are CTEs, career and technical education. And so not only um, do they not have to pay anything for materials, but they can get money for teaching the course. So we're gonna try to send out the message that this is really important. A lot of people really wanted this. Um, so work with us to either implement it optionally or, or we will try to pass another bill next time. So I do agree with local control, but sometimes you have to nudge. <laughs> and then special education. I had a bill regarding special education. One of the things that I heard from a lot of teachers is they don't have the resources in the classroom. Um, they don't have the training, they don't have the help. And so there were um, well, at least a couple of bills to deal with special education. One was to set up coursework for our university students to have just, if they want to go into special education, to have a coursework designed for that. The other was to incorporate coursework into all of the classes that teachers are taking so that, because most of the children are integrated into the classroom, so every teacher needs to know a little bit about managing um, kids with special needs. And then the teacher retirement system. We did a really great thing for our teachers. Um, they are getting a 13th check, I think $2,000. They, um, they have bolstered the retirement system. And um, so we, we helped out the retired teachers as well. Okay, next. So on the environment, we didn't do enough, in my opinion. Um, I think that the TCEQ, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, is similar to the EPA. We have not funded it enough. We don't have enough people who are able to look out after the air, the water quality. And so we see things like the Deer Park fires. Being on the Homeland Security Committee, I was part of the special group that was pulled together to um, talk to TDEM, which is the Texas Department of Urgent, uh, Emergency Management and TCEQ and how they handled that situation, the fires. And one of the questions that I cut off by the committee chair was about the fact that TCEQ just has not been following up on pollutants, pol polluters. Um, at Deer Park, the chemical factory plant, whatever, there had, had a number of instances where they had been polluting. They had not been doing what they should have been doing, and TCEQ didn't follow up with it. Um, but I got cut off because the chair said, we're talking specifically about the Deer Park fire, not about things that have happened in the past. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we will be having more meetings over the interim with, that, with the two committees coming together to look at how they handled it, the emergency, once the fires happened, and also to look at how we can keep that from happening in the future. Um, so the one bill that I passed with regards to environment is the Southwest Travis County Groundwater Conservation District. It will simply allow for them to hold their ratification election. The, the district has actually been operating since last session, but they didn't hold a confirmation election, and so they don't really have the authority to do all the things that they need to do. But because they're so interested in doing the research, finding out how monitoring the wells, determining how much water is in the wells, how much uh, refilled, they have been working with the Barton Springs Edwards Aquifer. They've actually been doing a lot of great work um, already over the last couple of years. So the confirmation in November, if any of y'all are in that area, County, you'll be voting on, on the confirmation election in November, and hopefully we can do a lot of education between now and then to let people know why it's so important to have the district. It won't um, incur taxes. It's based on permit fees for, for the uh, wells that are out there and, and new wells that will be built. Climate change, there were actually a couple of bills that I filed with Representative Anchia to set up a commission for Texas on climate change. Never got a hearing. <laughs> so we, we, don't, we 
I don't think I ever heard the words uttered on the House floor. And I think Aaron Zwiener actually had a bill saying that uh, TCEQ can, or employees of TCEQ cannot be um, penalized for or punished for using the words climate change in a report. <laughs> Is that not crazy? <laughs> so we have a ways to go on, on climate. And then electric vehicles and TERP. So the TERP fund is the Texas Emission Reduction Program, has about $1.7 billion in it, but that money doesn't get appropriated because it's what we use to ensure that, to balance the budget. And so a lot of us saw a problem with that. Well, it's very but which has not been going to our parks. And so this time around, there was a bill that did pass, and so y'all will be voting in November on a constitutional amendment saying that the sporting goods sales tax will go to our parks. Um, similarly, there was a bill passed that says that we're gonna set up a new account separate from out, outside the general revenue account that any money coming in that would typically go into the TERP fund will now go into this other account <coughs> and we can actually appropriate that money. So it's kind of crazy. I, you've probably heard Senator Watson in the past talk about transparency and taxation, and a lot of that is just about how we're spending money, and we're not always spending money the way it's intended. And so um, we hopefully we'll get the money to be going to clean our air, since that's the intent. Now, during the budget process, I did try to get an, a, a rider attached to the budget that would allow for charging stations at the Capitol. Um, I recently bought an electric vehicle and I love it, but just thinking about some of the other legislators coming in from out of town, let's say they're coming from Houston, they get to Austin, their battery's drained, wouldn't it be nice for them to be able to charge their electric vehicle at the Capitol? Um, but it didn't make it. However, I wasn't even asking for an allocation of money, it's already there in the TERP fund, I simply wanted to take some of a small amount of that TERP money to do it, but um, maybe next time. And actually, Austin does have a lot of charging stations, so I think we're in good shape. So did the bill pass that will set up a new account for TERP? Yeah, it has passed, so a lot of things are still waiting on the governor to sign. So I can't say it's law yet, but um, go ahead. And in healthcare, again, I think that we just didn't make enough progress. You know, we, we don't have the composition in the house to get Medicaid expansion, for example. And I have to tell you a story about one of the bills. So, as we all know, Texas has the highest maternal mor mortality rate. And they set up a committee between sessions to study it and to come up with some suggestions on how to fix that. So one of the bills was a result of that. And it said that we're gonna notify women who qualify that they can get into the Texas Healthy Women program. So when the bill came up, um, Donna Howard added an amendment that would say, not only are we going to send them a letter letting them know that they can get into this program, but if they qualify, we're gonna automatically sign them up. And oh my God, <laughs> the Republicans were, were like, oh, Medicaid expansion, Medicaid expansion. <laughs> and so they were going to kill the entire bill. And um, so Representative Howard stripped her amendment and we took a vote on it and the bill actually did not pass because the Republicans were not paying attention and they thought the amendment was still on it and they thought that meant Medicaid expansion. So we had to call the bill up for reconsideration, which you can do if somebody who voted against it asks for that. And um, we explained, they went around to all the Republicans and said, hey, we stripped the amendment. It's not gonna sign anybody up automatically. We're simply sending a letter out, letting them know. And remember, this is because of our maternal mortality problem. And they're like, oh, guess what? It passed unanimously. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, then there was Senate Bill 22 and House Bill 16. Um, House Bill 16 is one that already uh, one of my opponents in the Republican primary has used to say that I'm for uh, killing a baby inside and outside the womb. So it was the, what did they call it? The ba baby born alive bill. So essentially, um, this doesn't happen. And essentially, it's already in law. There's already a state and federal law that says, should a baby be born alive after an attempted abortion, that the doctor would take care of it. That's already in law. So this bill was 
really just something that the Republicans can use now in general election literature saying, guess what? Your representative wants to kill babies inside and outside the womb. So just a heads up. I've already seen it on social media. <laughs> but um, some, that's some of the crazy stuff that goes on in the legislature. Senate Bill 22 defends Planned Parenthood. Um, they, the city council was very smart, though, because they have the 7th Street uh, Planned Parenthood location that they've been getting their rent for a dollar a year. And uh, prior to the bill passing, the city council renewed it for another 20 years. <laughs> no matter how many people got up and testified that you know, this ties into the maternal mortality issue as well. It's health care for women. You know, that location did not do abortions. Um, but, you know, you just have the Republicans who kind of have this wall. <laughs> so then uh, hemp and medical marijuana. We did get a little bit of expansion when it comes to medical marijuana. And we did get the hemp bill passed. Um, they also tried, uh, Representative Joe Moody tried to uh, add to decriminal, decriminalization of marijuana. Um, he was very proud to have gotten it passed out of the House and to have talked to the governor beforehand to say, is this something that you're going to sign? He worked so hard. He got the governor's buy-in. He had to make a couple of tweaks to the bill. We got it passed out of the House pretty with a great vote. And then two hours later, Dan Patrick says it's dead on arrival in the Senate. So we're going to have to keep working on that too. Go ahead to the next. Gun safety. Ah, you know, we just, we're not getting anywhere on that issue here in Texas. And um, I actually asked to be on the Homeland Security and Public Safety Committee so that I could be there for a lot of the gun bills. Um, it was a tough committee to be on. And I knew, you know, while there's um, a lot of people are saying, hey, let's ban assault rifles. Well, in Texas, I don't think that's not going to pass probably. All I did, I filed a bill that said, let's let our public universities choose whether or not guns are allowed on campus. <laughs> <clears throat> I can't remember now how many people came to testify against that bill and the arrows that were shot in my direction. It, w it was tough. I mean, um, I've got pretty thick skin, but it was tough having somebody come up and testify and say, shame on you, which they did. And then I had another bill that related to guns that I thought, ah, oh, this is just a real nothing bill. Nobody's going to be bothered by it. It simply said that the signage that you have to use on the outside of a restaurant or a business, that telling people they can't carry a gun inside would be smaller. And um, right now it's just, they're huge. And restaurants don't like putting them in their windows. Because, and the letters have to be an inch tall. They have to say a specific thing. And they ha it has to be in English and Spanish. And really, people are going to get the idea if you have a gun with a circle and a line. <laughs> right? You could say concealed carry and have a little picture and, or um, open carry picture, whatever. I mean, you could do a real simple thing. Well, the person that brought this was um, a cupcake shop owner, and she had a real cute uh, door with all of her cupcake pictures and you know everything on the door. And she's like, I don't want this gun sign on my front door. And so I thought, oh, that's a pretty simple request. Who could be against that? <laughs> well, <laughs> the testimony was just as negative on that bill. And so I, I was like, I dropped it, I said, OK. We're not getting that one out of committee either. Um, so we did have one bill that looked like it was going to make it, this public awareness campaign for safe storage, because this will help not, not only with um, all kinds of gun accidents between kids um, and also suicide prevention. You know, people get a hold of guns and uh, bad things happen. So this bill just said that we are going to encourage people if they have a gun, to store it safely, to store it locked up in a safe. It was uh, Donna Howard's bill that I co or joint authored, and I got up and testified in committee because of my own personal experience. We had everybody in favor of it in committee. I mean, even the NRA 
at one point was in favor of it, but then they changed. I'm not sure what happened, but um, the bill didn't make it, long story short. However, Representative Howard did get a million dollars in the state budget in order for DPS, or I think it is DPS, to come up with a campaign, kind of like click it or ticket, just something quick, catchy. So they have the money in the budget to do it. So she's, she's been around for a while. She knows some <laughs> tricks. And I'm learning from her. <clears throat> we did take some steps backward, though. We um, expanded the Marshall Program. So initially, so the Marshall Program just says that teachers, coaches, school employees can carry guns for protection. They have to have 80 hours of training, I believe. Um, but I've, I've heard that that's just not really adequate. And I've heard from so many people saying, students even saying, I just can't see my teacher carrying a gun around. Um, it just doesn't seem like a good idea. But what we had heard is that, okay, here in Austin, for example, we have our school resource officers, we've got police nearby, we've got people who can come in the case of an emergency and get there quickly. But in rural areas, we don't have that. So, so the school marshal program is needed in rural areas. That's what people are saying. Um, so I tried to add an amendment that would say in counties over a certain population, um, or rather counties under a certain population, they could have the school marshal program. Um, because I knew the bill was gonna pass. So let's at least make a bad bill a little bit better. Um, they went from allowing one school marshal to trying to get it to um, one per hundred students, to they basically said one or more. So now any school can have one or more. I mean, there's no limit. And then um, allowing guns to be carried in places of worship. So next screen. Transportation, um, I got the five minute warning from, oh wait, that was for 25 minutes, but she told me I had 45 minutes. Oh, okay. So we're good. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, the transportation and safety. One bill that I worked really hard on was, um, I ended up calling it the Dr. Michael Babineau Act after Dr. Michael Babineau, who lost his life on Highway 71 last October. So um, as a result of that, his neighbors and friends came together and formed Safer 71. They've had a lot of traffic fatalities out off 71 close to Sweetwater. It's a very dangerous area for a number of different reasons. Some of it has to do with the terrain. Some of it has to do with just bad drivers. And so they came to me and asked if I would file a bill that would set up safety corridors similar to work construction zones. So in those areas, if somebody is speeding, the traffic fine is doubled. You would have a sign at either end letting you know you're in a, a safety corridor. And in fact, other states have these. So if you've ever dr driven into New Mexico, you may have seen them there. There's about six states that have them. So it took a lot of work. I got it through the Transportation Committee with a lot of effort and a lot of explaining since it's something new and, and some people were um, concerned about, well, double the fines, that's a lot of money. What if someone can't pay it? Then they lose their driver's license. So we had a lot of different arguments. Um, the guy from West Texas said, well, in West Texas, we feel neglected. We put a lot of money into the state coffers through our oil and oil revenue, um, but we, our roads are horrible. He says, we don't need safety corridors, we need better roads. So um, in order to address that, I said, another complaint was, what if I don't want them in my area? You know. So we added an, um, a line in there that simply said, it has to be requested by a local elected official. So I said, that way, if you don't want it in your area, you won't have to have it. But we want it. I've got people who are asking for this. And uh, in fact, Stacy Suits is here, and he's been to many of those Safer 71 meetings. And we know that it's not just the corridor itself that would help, but just increased enforcement. And so I really have to give a shout out for uh, Constable Suits and the effort that he's put in out there. <clears throat> So it ended up not passing, even though I got it out of the transportation committee. I just, I'd kind of used up all of my chips on getting things onto the house floor. And so I didn't have any left, but then I found a bill that I could amend it to and the auth bill author, it was another safety bill, but a little bit different subject. He was willing to have it on his bill. And so normally you would say the author accepts this amendment and that's that. But, um, and you would vote on the bill itself. but. Jonathan Sticklin, Representative Sticklin, um, was angry at me that day. <laughs> yes. 
because some of the Democrats had been chubbing. We had been doing this thing that we try to delay. It's a delay tactic, kind of like in the Senate, they do the filibuster. Um, so he basically called for a vote on my amendment, and then uh, many of the Republicans voted against it because of the, the chubbing episode. So I did not get it through this time, but I will continue to work on it. Um, also, uh, just transportation is such an issue. One of the things that I really enjoyed early in session was bringing uh, Cap Metro and the mayor of Lago Vista together. It was a little bit heated because the mayor of Lago Vista had come to me asking for me to file a bill saying that the residents there could vote to get out of Cap Metro because they weren't happy with what Cap Metro was doing and they were putting a lot of money into it. And I said, well, I don't think I'm really willing to do that. I, I think that, you know, public transit is important. Why don't y'all talk together and see if you can get a better public transit system that works for you. And so I brought the two of them together. They had a little bit of a heated discussion in my office. <laughs> but I, I just think when you bring people together like that, they're, they're going to communicate. They're going to try to work for a better solution. Even the mayor of Laga Vista understands that we do need pl public transit. And the head of Cap Metro understands we've got to do something to make them happy because even though this bill is not going to be filed letting them vote in 2019, they do get to vote in 2021. And so they, they need to make some changes to make it uh, where the voters are going to want to continue with Cap Metro. Um, but as far as roads go, there's a lot going on with TxDOT. We've got the Oak Hill Parkway that's starting, SH-45 just opened up, um, 620 is being expanded in the Lakeway area, and then up in uh, the Steiner Ranch, um, 620-2222 area, there's a bypass that started. And then they need to do some work even further up going to Anderson Mill. So TxDOT, I've been in touch with them on a regular basis, and we're just trying to keep things moving along in the district. Okay. Uh, and y'all might have read that actually I think it's, um, I don't know if it's because of my safety corridor bill that they had this big announcement about trying to um, have safer highways. There has been a death on a Texas highway every single day since November 2000. I mean, it's just incredible. There's not been a day that has gone by without a death on a Texas highway since then. And so they're really putting an effort into making the roads safer. And so I, I, I thought, great. So they should be all on board with my, my uh, safety corridor thing. So we'll see. Anyway, those are some really tough statistics to look at. Ah, elections and redistricting. So um, I would imagine some of y'all came or emailed about SB9, right? <laughs> that was the really bad voter suppression bill. And I have to say that people showing up makes such a difference. Some of us showed up and they closed. They closed at 830. So they did close it at 830. It was the craziest thing. But they were a with as many people that got there between 8 and 830. They went until after midnight with the testimony, and that made the difference. The, I, I was honestly, I was surprised because in one of the committees I was on, the committee chair would say, okay, I've heard enough of this. We're cutting it back to one minute per testimony. I mean, the committee chair could have cut it off, but she actually kept it going past midnight, which delayed things another day, which really meant, and I think she saw the writing on the wall that this, I think it would be bad for both parties. I mean, you're, you're suppressing votes. But the really bad thing is that even though that bill itself didn't pass, we did pass a bill, I hate to say we, but <laughs> a bill passed that cuts out mobile voting. And honestly, I mean, that hurts people in both parties. It, it hurts people who live further out. Laga Vista is a good example of where mobile voting is really used. And uh, I think even here, this has been a location for mobile voting. Um, so it, that's, to me, almost one of the worst bills that we passed during session. I know when we were campaigning, we talked a lot about setting up an independent redistricting committee so that we didn't have politicians picking their voters. That just didn't get any traction this time. Representative Donna Howard filed a bill like she has done in the past. I don't think it even got a committee hearing. There's just not the, the will to do that. Um, and next session, we have redistricting coming up. So this is a huge thing. I mean, if there is any reason that gets you out block walking this time around, it's redistricting. Because this will have an effect for the next decade. Who, who is drawing those lines is going to determine 
who gets into office over the next decade. And then biggest win, oh, I, we talked about that, SB9. Okay. Um, and then, of course, um, it was the Kumbaya session, but there were the divisive moments. The Chick-fil-A bill, I don't know if y'all know, you can watch testimony even after the fact. You can go and watch it. Ju Representative Julie Johnson gave the most heart-wrenching testimony on that, um, and several members. Aaron Zwiener got up there and spoke, um, just saying, look, this is so hurtful to the LGBTQ community. Don't do this. You know, it, it, it doesn't serve any good purpose. They are saying that it's religious freedom, but it, that's not really the point. But they passed the bill anyway. Um, the 1% sales tax increase that the Republicans were really hoping to get to offset the school finance. So here's the thing with the school finance bill. There's no new revenue streams. So while we're putting all this new money, all this money into public education this time around, there's no new revenue stream. So at some point, if we have a downturn in the economy, it's going to be very problematic. Um, right now, things are going great. Hopefully, things will continue to go great. But at some point, yes? I just wanted to comment on the 1% sales tax. That's a 16.5% increase. increase. It's a one cent increase. And so I think it's important that we couch it that way because people think, ah, 1%, no big deal. Oh, you're, you're absolutely right. I should have put one cent. And the beneficiaries of that are not the property tax. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. It's really a way to cut additional property taxes on the business community. Right, so... Yeah, and I think that's why it died, because across the board, it's a nonpartisan issue. It doesn't, it helps the wealthiest when you, um, it's a very regressive tax, and so that, that's why the increase in the sales tax didn't pass. But one bill that passed the House, it didn't, it died in the Senate, thank goodness, but it was by Representative Murr, and it said that um, in, starting in 2021, school districts cannot collect property taxes for M&O. And we're going to do a study on how to how much we need to increase consumption taxes to offset that. So that's their plan. That's yes. Oh, maintenance and operations. So just your regular budget. You know, your you've got maintenance and operation. Then you have your INS, which pays for the buildings. Um, and uh, so I talked about the Born Alive bill. <coughs> And then um, another very divisive issue was the tax cap on the cities and counties. Even Lakeway, which is a conservative part of the district, was, was um, complaining about the 3.5% because they've just built a new police station. And looking at the budget, they were saying, this, this could be problematic. How are we going to operate our new police station with this tax cap? So um, I, I think it's, it's going to be hurtful. City budgets are mainly your police, fire, EMS, um, parks, libraries, a lot of good things. You know, our cities are doing a lot of really good things. And so I think the tax cap could end up being problematic. We'll see what happens. Um, maybe in next session we'll be undoing some things. I don't know. Okay, and then overall, if people are always asking, how did your first term go? I think it went great, you know, for a freshman Democrat in the minority party. Uh, did really good to get some bills passed. I got five bills onto the governor's desk. Um, a couple of them were pretty small mud bills, but you know those are important too. Those one of them is a Laga Vista mud. They've um, it's in the city of Laga Vista, so and that's something that they asked for. Another one was for uh, Travis County. They wanted the ability to do online auctions. They were given that ability a couple of years ago, but it didn't. Uh, there was a little tweak that needed to be made so that they could actually use it. And so um, got that passed, got the groundwater district passed, and then a neighbor, another neighborhood bill. So um, while they're kind of smaller bills, they're very important to those communities. And of course, uh, you know, I, this was my testi testimony for the DNA bill. You can't see it very well in the lighting, but um, I was speaking for the bill, and off to the side of me was Representative Toth just looking very <laughs> angry. And they tend to do that. When you get up there and you're doing something they don't like, they try to be as intimidating as possible, which I found amusing. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, I've tried, I tried several amendments on the, um, 
budget, riders, and several amendments on the House, uh, the school finance bill. So got a lot of practice being up there at the microphone and feel like I am very well prepared for next session. All right. And so what happens now? We will have some interim assignments for our um, committees. So the, like I said, the Homeland Security and Public Safety Committee will be having some meetings about the Deer Park fires and probably about DPS as well. I don't know if y'all are aware, but one of the things that DPS does is they do the driver's license renewals. And if y'all have had to do that lately, if you've had to go to a driver's license office, the lines are really long and you think they're bad in a big city. When you go out apparently to the rural areas, you may have to drive a couple of hours. You may have to wait hours in line. And so there's been so many complaints that this session they said, well, we're thinking about taking that responsibility away from DPS and moving it over to the Department of Motor Vehicles which honestly, you know, you're just taking something from one office, moving it to another, if you're not giving more money for people, because that's really what you need, is more people to be able to handle all of the new residents in Texas. So anyway, we'll be, we'll be given interim assignments to look at issues that uh, are ongoing. And of course, I will have my re-election campaign kickoff in September, so watch Facebook and find out when, when things are happening. <clears throat> and I have a town hall scheduled with um, some other fabulous elected women leaders here in Southwest. Uh, that will be June 18th. It's at 7 o'clock at the Wildflower Center. So a wonderful venue and uh, we'll have a great Great conversation with Representative Donna Howard, City Council Member Paige Ellis, uh, AISD Board Member Arthi Sign, and uh, uh, JP Sylvia Holmes. S Seven o'clock on June 18th. And with that, I will open it up for questions. Yes. The Robin Hood. The, uh, Robin Hood and recapture so the question is what about that so recapture was reduced quite a bit just as a result of the increase in the basic allotment um, the formulas were changed pretty significantly so in the past one of the things that representative Diego Bernal really likes is that you know we we still need to make sure that it's equitable so that our low socioeconomic students are getting what they need and so in the past, they've grouped free and reduced lunch kids that are getting free and reduced lunch into one category, and they've based the weights. They get extra money for those kids. They've based it on that one category. Well, now they're breaking it up into two categories because there's a difference between a child who's getting a free lunch versus one who's getting a reduced lunch, the difference in their socioeconomic uh, situation. And so the it's supposed to really pinpoint where the need is the greatest and send more resources there. The, there's also more in, um, more weight to the special ed category, so, and, and there's a new category for dyslexic students. So they will be getting more resources as well. Yes. Ooh, that is a good question. So uh, just because we're doing the Facebook Live thing, I, I'm going to repeat the question. So there's a bill that says, y'all have probably all gotten those phone calls when it, the phone number looks similar to yours. And so you think it must be somebody legitimate, and then it's a telemarketer. So there, the bill, or once it's signed by the governor, the law would say that these companies can't mask a phone number to make it look like a local number. I don't know what the penalties are on that. I'll... Mm -hmm. So I answered the phone and I said, so I knew it was uh, somebody that was using a bogus one. I answered the phone and said, it's really nice to speak to somebody from Austin. Okay. I said, actually, I'm in Miami, the water. And so I said, well, the Texas legislature has passed the bill that's on the government desk mm -hmm. right now to make it illegal what you just did using a fictitious uh, ID that I hung up. They called me 17 times. Ha <laughs> ha. 
Oh, oh no. I know. Wow. Yeah, I know those phone calls are really annoying, and so I, I was happy to see that we passed a bill that would basically outlaw that. So I, I will follow up, and I'll see what I can find out about what the penalty is. I'm not really sure. All right, anybody else? Yes. So I think what you're talking about is if, if somebody helps out a candidate who's running against a, an incumbent, that that would be looked on very poorly. And actually, that happened last time. So y'all might be familiar with uh, Representative Celia Israel went out and did some block walking in Dallas and Houston. And she essentially was punished for that this session. So I, I'm sure that that is likely to happen again next session, although you never know. We could flip enough seats and we might have a different speaker. <laughs> yes. Um, that's a really good question about the plumber board and that whole thing was a very, um, it didn't go the way a lot of us thought it was going. What happened was when uh, it was a sunset bill and part of it was the plumbing board that licenses plumbers. And when it came up, it, the plumbing board I guess has had a lot of issues and they've been given some time to address those issues and so sunset recommended folding that board into TDLR, Texas Department of Licensing and regulation. Um, so when it came up, uh, Representative Symphonia Thompson got up and she had an amendment saying, we're going to give that board two more years to get their act together. That passed. Then it went to the Senate. We ha they had the conference committee that stripped out that amendment and then it came back to the House for a final vote. And again, Symphonia Thompson got up there very upset saying, I can't believe the Senate pulled out this amendment. It gave them two more years. We, we don't need to fold this into TDLR, and I'm asking every member to vote against the sunset bill. Don't worry, there's the safety net bill. Well, we didn't realize that the safety net bill hadn't passed, and so there's not a safety net bill. The bill didn't pass because Representative Thompson has a lot of clout, and she got the vote she needed, and so, um, so as of September, we don't have a plumber licensing board. But I read an article saying and counties will take up that responsibility. I don't think that's the best solution, but maybe that's what will happen until we have a chance to address it in the next session. So, yes. The, okay, so the question is about uh, banning semi-automatic rifles and why I felt like that was not something to, to a bill to file. And the reason being... Oh, no, I or, wasn't asking that for oh. you. I was just wondering with you as a committee member on mm -hmm. the Homeland Security Committee, when you said you were talking about regulations for guns, I was just wondering, is it is it a matter of personal safety? And I wasn't trying to, like, make a... I, Um, I think it's just the so the Republican platform says they want constitutional carry. They don't want any law that will infringe upon their Second Amendment right to have a gun. That's the bottom line. And um, the committee composition, many of the committees are nine members, and many of them are five Republicans and four Democrats. 
And so you know going in that if it's some controversial topic, you're going to have to work really hard to get it through, and there's some that just you know aren't going to get through. Um, even with the bill that I filed on, on the campus carry, uh, the committee chair said, I will give you a hearing, but it's not getting out of committee. I can tell you that now. Oh, not, you know, they, uh, so they all seem to come from a different area. Like the, the Rio Grande guys who t tend to be pro-gun, it's because where they live, you know, it's self-defense. It's, um, I hate to say it, but one of the, it, it's a tradition that we all get a committee chair a gift at the end of the session. One of the committee chair gifts was a gun. You know, yes. <laughs> it, that wasn't my committee, and it wasn't my choice. <laughs>
yeah. I mean, I have to medicate myself with, you know, <laughs> my, something before I go in. It's just, how do you... How my do you advice for going and, and having an impact at the Capitol is that maybe seeing Representative Biederman might not be the best use of your time because... <laughs> But, but when uh, there's a bill that you want to pass or not pass, going to committee, and even if you don't want to testify, just registering for or against that bill. Like I said, it shows up on our computers. We can see how many people have come to register for and against, and that makes a big impact. You know, um, when nobody registers, it's like, well, this must not, must not impact anybody. Well, what I would say to that too is when a committee chair is doing things that you don't think are right, maybe letting the media know because sometimes um, media, social media, they, they get pushback. For, and an example, right after the Santa Fe shooting, as I was block walking, I saw a flyer for the governor that had a gun giveaway. And it was totally inappropriate. And it got on social media, got picked up by the New York Times, and he finally pulled it down. I mean, he said, we're not going to do the gun giveaway after all. But so sometimes going to the media and saying, hey, they shut down testimony at 830 in the morning. Can you believe that? And if it gets out there, that might make them have a different uh, game plan the next time around. All right. So I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vicki. We got your back.